and we are recording. Rachel, Claire, Q A R A N C, Quarank, Army nurses, ex Army nurses. Yeah. Uh, uh, previously, and more recently, starting up the Just a Mum podcast, and uh, finally managed to get you both in the studio. Very, very, very happy. Excited for the podcast and the conversation, just based on the icebreaker that we've just done. <laughs> Pleasure to have you in the studio. Uh, thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Right. Let's kick off with a little term I just heard on the icebreaker, which I've not heard before, but apparently I'm not part of. The manosphere. Come yes. on. Well, it's, it's a new term. I've only learnt this in the past few weeks as well. So I came across it somewhere. I don't know, down some like rabbit hole. Social and, media. Yeah, social hole. media. And someone mentioned the term, which just described what I'd been seeing. So there's, it was just like described certain pockets of social media and maybe certain podcasts and areas of, I um, don't want to group them all, to, all men together. So we, we're saying it's not all men, but <laughs> just a group of um, people who have certain views and maybe like more sort of misogynistic views and i think that it's referred to as like the manosphere sexist misogynist podcast yeah like but the ex worry is extreme more you know the more extreme type yeah. views and young people the worry is young people listening to it and it being quite very old-fashioned point of view of the man and the woman traditional roles and all that and listening to it what do you mean or just or watching it, it listen to it yeah if younger people listen to that going oh i was brought up a little bit more thinking that equality and then i'm suddenly falling down these rabbit holes and hearing different things people and realizing well that's not quite how the world that is it, it should go back to how it was and yeah there's certain areas though that i do feel like drawn to that, that i do sort of i don't want to say agree with I don't think we should go all the way back to how things were, but I think that certain things aren't working. I suppose that's equality and equity. I, yeah, I, I, I believe more in equity. I've learned the difference between them two words when they say equality. It's like, but we're not all the same. And I feel like, why is that such a big revelation to say that men and women aren't the same? Like, they're not. And equity fits that better, where it's like, you still... You get the same opportunities, but you're not treated the same because you're not the same. So the fence and, you know, the yeah. fence analogy with the boxes and the short person, and the tall person. No, go tall on. Tall person can see over the fence and the short person stood next to them. <clears throat> That's a quality in that they can, they're both stood at the fence. They, both, the get the, they both get the same box because, you know, one's short, one's tall. They both get the same box. That's equality. But the tall person can see That's over it. the fence. The short person still can't see over the fence. Equity would be you give two boxes to the short person, but the tall person gets none, but they both can see over the fence. That's equity. So that I makes think sense. thinking of men and women is then that we are, women want to be able to work women and equal pay, all that jazz, but we do have the babies and have that side of it. So <clears throat> if we had equality and everyone's treated exactly the same it just doesn't work because i suppose you could there are examples like paternity leave and maternity leave but even that's different because the woman needs time to recover man might need, might need time to recover but and not in exactly the you same tend way. to have what we've learned is there is a default parent there is there does tend to be doesn't matter whether it's male or female but there is a default parent the one parent who takes on the majority of you know, like the tasks and the responsibilities, that's just how it is. So it's, I know some people can work out 50-50, but in general, it tends to be like one person. Mm, it's an interesting point you raised about the, the motherhood side of things when we're talking about equality and equity is that, I think about this last week, it's almost like at the moment, <clears throat> and you may be able to speak to this more than, I will, because I'm a bloke. I'm not in that circle. I'm certainly not in that social media. I don't see what you guys see on there. Um, well, and vice versa. But the point I'm making is, it's almost like a woman choosing to be a mother right now 
instead of choosing to forge a, a successful career path and go up the chain and be a CEO, the, the, the mother who wants, the woman who wants to do the traditional thing of, I'll, I'm quite happy being a mother, thank you, and that's what, that's what I want to do. That's almost like an outcast, right? Couldn't be almost like an outcast right now and be attacked for that because it's not in line with the, the, the some aspects of the feminist movement, particularly the more activist elements of it. It doesn't line up with the whole patriarchy talk and anti-men talk and everything else that we were just sort of mentioning. Do you, does that ring true in any sense of the word? So outcast well, to wanting to be tra a traditional woman, and, and I use that yeah, I, I use that hard. term loosely, right? Because traditions always change. It you know what the one one of the good things is on on the flip side. One of the good things is right now because of the feminist movement, because of lots of changes over the last couple of decades, it is that women are treated much better in the workplace. Uh, the you know there is majority equal opportunity. I think for women to explore what men want to explore, right? Um, but obviously, there's still some gaps. No, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to stop <laughs> digging myself into a hole, yeah. Do you mean if someone chooses to be, for want of a better phrase, just the mum, um, <laughs> is that going against, do you think they're outcast, do you mean? They're, they're going against what we should, what we're told we should be doing because of the equality drive. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, I, almost like it's a wrong yeah. thing to do. Well, we both kind of did that. Um, well, I feel like we've done, because we've kind of done, I feel like I've done both. So yeah. like, like feminism stuff didn't really come across my radar. So when I joined the army, d I just didn't pay attention to any of it. I didn't feel the need to, um, because I'd, you know, I could join the army. I yeah. could do what I wanted. And but don't you I think had our that freedom. was very female heavy? Yeah. So within the QAs, it's the opposite. So we outnumber the men within our core so we didn't have that so we had men trying to get in our yeah trying to get in our you know meetings not literally but you know the men were the minority in our core so yeah. i think we didn't get it we didn't have it it's a bit so in real life when you get it's, out and yeah leave. and it's i've only just looked into it recently because like since becoming a parent i then started experiencing some differences, let's say, or like struggles with going back to work and um, childcare and stuff like that. And that's when I was like, oh, something's like not quite worked out here. Cause it, my plan was, I was always told, uh, concentrate on your career, get your career first, then have a family and that'll set you for life basically. And it's just like, it's not worked out that way. It's, um, yeah, I, it was, everything was great while I had a career, but trying to do, I've a career and children is very difficult and I've tried lots of different avenues. I've tried my own business and um, like I said, not returned to nursing because of the difficulties with shift work and childcare. Um, I've tried loads of different av avenues, you know, a book was the podcast done and, and I just, and trying to balance that around children, I've found it really difficult. So, and, but, and then I always want to know why I'm like, well, why is it difficult? Um, and I want solutions. And I'm like, what is the best solution? What is the best like child, you know, like work life balance? Um, and it's I've, it's, I've ended up going into feminism and then just thinking like, go, you I mean almost- You mean exploring it? Yeah, just exploring the ideas and thinking, is, is it working at the minute? Um, I think it works if you're single or you don't have children, but once you have, children well, what's your definition of feminism though so well i've i looked up the english de definition i prefer to stick to that one because it's it is like um equality for women but like we were just saying if you go into that i'm just like not sure if like we're saying about equality with like equity is better because e equality means the same as and we're not the same but i think it means like the same opportunities so when i've looked into feminism as well um there's like four waves of feminism so it's a really broad term to say um oh feminism you know if you're like yeah, well, feminism's right. rubbish yeah. it's like well no there's four waves the first wave was necessary because we need in order to get a bank account a man had to sign 
for us to get a bank account and that was only in the 70s and it was difficult for a woman to leave the home if she was being abused so the first wave of feminism feminism was necessary but i would say the current wave of feminism and like you said it's quite anti-male isn't working and it shouldn't be anti-male like that's just <coughs> well, I, I, I think just what's happened with it is it, so that's why i asked about the definition of fem feminism i think what's happened with with feminism is however you want to define it but let's just let's just broadly define it as what in what in what is fair and right for females right mm -hmm. and but then how you define how do you define that what do you think is fair and right okay it's the same thing that's happened to veganism as an example and other things where you've got an absolutely genuine you know it's, it's a genuine thing to want to strive to achieve to for <coughs> for uh, a a demographic to be treated equally or as they should and no less than anyone else because of the demographic part like females right but feminism has been hijacked i think by certain industries and certain and certain and social media because it it spins money and spins discourse yeah. and social discourse thing and it's not i'm oversimplifying it right and the same with veganism it's like you've got if you think what's your definition of veganism you can a, you can ask someone and they go fucking vegans you know, morons doing X, Y, and Z. They're always out there protesting, and that's not all vegans. <laughs> but there's, there's vegans yeah, who are just they just vegan, and they can, yeah, you just sit, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's been hijacked. Um, to to so then what you do have is the in inverted commas feminist activists or the most outspoken feminists there are are like the worst advocates. They're the worst advocates. They're so militant yeah. about it. And to your point, you're being anti-male. It's like that. Being anti male is as disastrous as males being anti female or anyone yeah. being anti female. You know, it's uh, it's crazy. It's, it's, uh, what, well, what I'm seeing a little bit is, um, yeah, like saying the extreme side is is anti male, but then what I'm also starting to see is some <coughs> another sort of like mini movement coming through of women who are then attacking feminism, who are then sticking up for the males in doing that they're becoming anti-female and i'm like you're defeating it's the a purpose bit we shouldn't be an yeah. anti anything <clears throat> yeah. like you know we should be trying to bring men and women together not turning fem like saying all right yeah feminism's not working this is the extreme this is anti but we shouldn't then become anti-female because of that like that's not how you solve but the, the, the issue yeah so the premises on which that those kind of things are based like anti-male and, and patriarchy for example and even if you look at we can talk about you know racial discrimination when you look at race uh you know the race issues now um and like feminist issues now one of the one of the things that, one of the ways they paint historical situations to your point about in the 90, I didn't realize it was that recent 1970s, having to get yeah. a bloke to sign for your bank. That's in the UK, right? Was it? Yeah. In the UK, yeah, so a bloke had to sign for a woman's bank account. But it's not like, so they bring up those things now as an example of how much how bad we are as a society. Whether we're talking about race, whether we're talking about um, sexual equality, how bad we are as a society now, as if those decisions then were like conscious decisions to keep women oppressed. But and and there was a conscious decision not to let black people vote in America, for example, because um, because to keep black people oppressed. It, it, they weren't decisions made like that when we could talk about women or, or on the racial thing. They were decisions that ended up being made because that's how it, it evolved to that point. It wasn't a conscious decision. It was a case of when it got to the point of you could have a bank account. Well, men had evolved to be of a higher status than women. So the natural thing at the point of have a bank account was, well, your men, if women want one, they'll have to get the bloke to sign for it. It wasn't, let's oppress women. Yeah. It's just the way it was. It yeah. wasn't like a conscious, let's keep women down. Do, do you know what I mean? And we get to the point now and think, wow, that was so wrong back then. But we didn't make the decision. It wasn't a decision made out of being complete bastards. It was just like at that point in evolution, that's what was normal. That's what was normal. And look where we are now. We yeah. don't have that anymore. But do you think for us coming through of our, as our generation, so we both joined the army, both had careers, both had opportunities, both knew we were going to work from a young age, probably encouraged by our parents to do certain things. Because So if we got to a point in our generation where we're like, actually, I feel we were quite equal. There'll be people who've had different experiences. There'll be people who've had different situations, different upbringings, 
Um, and there's lots of things going on. I think lots of things in America that we just hope don't edge this way. Um, but I think maybe we've got to a point where we're like, do we know what they're maybe questioning? Because I didn't have any dramas. I had my career. I then chose after having my children, it was my decision, okay, that's high likelihood I'm going to be deployed again. I don't want to leave my children. It's a high likelihood I'm going to have to keep moving around every couple of years and my husband might not be able to come. I don't want to do that anymore. And it was my decision then, knowing what the career, the job entailed, to, to leave and be just a mum for a bit. As it was when I was like, right, children are getting older now. I'm getting a bit bored, let's find a little job. So it's like, it was for me to decide. No one stopped me doing anything, no one asked me. No one said, you can't do this, you can't do that. So whether it's just that we're of a generation where we're like, all those things have already happened f to allow us to do what we've done. Maybe mm. feminism's getting to a point where we're like, where can it go? I, I think that's the case for, for most people at the moment, right? It's so most people from what you could describe as historically oppressed, oppressed groupings, let's talk female i think that's the case for most women now is that certainly from a practical aspect those barriers to to career advancement those barriers to going and doing things that previously you couldn't do they don't exist i'm generalizing but for the most part that's people's experience and we're talking about uk here right yeah i'm not even gonna we've speak to stay, i'm not even gonna yeah. mention like <laughs> no. uh, america probably close but we're only, speaking UK, we're only talking about the uk here um and that's not to say uh, uh, sexual discrimination doesn't exist but it's very very fucking isolated very isolated um, but but there is still the cultural aspect right where perhaps within a, a woman's mind and and, and in men's minds who are brought up in certain ways that perhaps there is that psychological uh, barrier to um, not realizing the opportunities there, perhaps because of your 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 mum and dad, just what you brought up in and what your experience of them was. You know, you, maybe your mother was always a stay at home mum, and maybe your dad has old school like old school values and standards, and that's what you're brought up with. Definitely. But outside in the practical sense of the word, you know, I, I try and find a job these days where you can walk in and the woman's going to get paid less than the man. Like, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Unless in some in some pockets, I was going to say I hope in not. some pockets um, of yeah. places <laughs> in yeah. certain parts of the country. And I think they're reviewing. I think every company's had to review. And I'd say like well, yeah, I'd say <clears throat> pre kids it didn't exist. And I ju I just think post children, I've ju I've just realised where that does. If you have children, I feel like that does have an effect. Then in because uh, that in my head it's it was like right two people chose to have a child that should be 50 50 and then i've just realized like it's it's not like that it is generally one person who is affected going back to work and the other isn't and and then it's just like you said finding the flexible work and just realizing i can't quite go back to nursing unless i found like a you know like a nine to five role um but in general, nursing, like shift work, it's it would be very difficult to go back to. And well, that's it. And the school holidays come around, and and, and then looking for other jobs as well. They, you know, it's like they expect a lot of weekends and evenings, and mm. I, I just, I just have myself difficulty covering them. So I've found difficulty going back to work, and that's where I, you know, I've sort of delved into. I suppose there's so many, <laughs> but there's so many layers. Because I'm like, why is it so difficult for me to like return back to work when yeah. you know two adults had a child and I'm and you're the one and I'm the one struggling. Well, everything's to get back being geared. Everything, <clears throat> everything work-wise is being geared towards supporting the mother not being in work. In terms of so, like like nine month paternity leave, for example, not nine month paternity, leave, patern maternity, maternity, <laughs> maternity. <laughs> Jesus Christ, maternity leave, for example. You know, it's being geared towards accommodating a woman giving birth and this is something else with it is right as well right we're in in that in that i think that generally work professional professional professionalism employment career is all is is geared towards men again going back to the evolutionary i don't want to give evil evolution as an excuse right but the fact of the matter is like of the two parents 
the one that is probably much better at being around in the child's life when the child is young is not the bloke, yeah. it's the mother. For a whole host of reasons, from physiological reasons to psychological reasons to emotional reasons to just there's a whole host of it. Whole host and of also it. like breastfeeding and yeah. if you want to breastfeed, yeah. 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 No, yeah. I, d- I agree. Um, I, ju- I just think, I do think like how do you make it work? And I know some... What can be done to accommodate mm. women who do want to get it, yeah allowing you know the paternity like to be taken by maternity or paternity taken by the dad as well and i have thought about that and i thought i mean if that works for the couple it would be it'd be down to them like what they want to do um but for me personally like i i know and i would have wanted to have done them initial few months um especially with like breastfeeding and stuff like i wouldn't have want to have left and gone back to work like pre having kids um i was planning on going back to work after a couple of months and i remember them laughing at me on the phone when they said when we be back to do agency and i said no i don't know maybe two three months and she started laughing <laughs> and then i had my baby she and then had kids yeah. yeah she obviously had kids and then obviously you hope like your whole world changes when you have a child and i just realized what she was on about i was like yeah i think it was like a year before i went to do agency again and that was only because it was forced because of money um that was something i was gonna add so, is yeah the privileged the privilege i had to be able to not work as well i mean sometimes childcare cost just prices you out of that it's not privileged to go well i'm gonna leave work because it costs that much to put my children in childcare or child so that i can work lots of people do the maths and go i'll be working for nothing um mm. so it makes sense yeah to both but to have the support um, and husband earning so that I could stay at home and be there for the children for a little while. But then I think it's my mental health and using my brain that meant as the youngest went to school and I'm like, right, I'm ready to find something. But again, it's looking. So what's the, so what's the barrier being, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, sorry. No, what's no. the barrier being to, um, I'll forget otherwise, I'll forget, right. What's the barrier being to getting back into work <clears> after, <throat> uh, well, after children? Thinking what's the barrier? about, six weeks holiday and where Child. the children yeah. are going to go Child for that. Care. So you can kind of think, all my kids are in school now. I drop them off at half eight to nine, pick them up three to half three, quarter past three. I could do something in those hours. Swing around a half term in May, October, Easter holiday, Christmas holiday, six weeks off for summer. Within those weeks, you're paying for childcare or massively juggling yeah. where they're going to be. And so, s- and so for, because like, slightly different because you've got a I'll, partner, I'll, so it can yeah, be so shared again, a bit. Whereas, got like, I'm a single parent. So when I look to going back to work, the ch- obviously I have to rely on childcare, like paid childcare. And when I did the maths, it just wasn't feasible, even with the help. Um, the childcare costs were the same as what my wage would have been and that wasn't including bills anything else like my wage would have just covered the childcare. so i was like this isn't possible like i is, can't go back is the challenge a little bit less now that more companies and more industries are accepting of working from home um i th- the, yeah so with that so that's why I did go to working from home instead I started looking at options to working from home and w- and working with I thought oh well it's fine I'll just um work from home with the children and I set up like an Etsy store and that did quite did generate a bit of income for a while did okay off that um but then as I had and that was okay when I had one but then when I had two and it was a baby and a toddler it became a lot more difficult and I just realized I was a little bit naive and I was like this is I can't work and look after a baby and a toddler it was too stressful there's only so much so, tv that you can watch yeah and then I was then doing it in the evening so I was waiting for them to go to sleep and then I was staying up to like two in the morning to do orders while they were asleep <coughs> and I was like this isn't sustainable I can't keep doing this because they're up at five so, so I, I was and like, you're compromising their growth, aren't you? Yeah, through that as well. well uh, so yeah, you can't so, just shut and it, it was too stressful. So I was like, I need another plan now. 
because this isn't working. Yeah. Um, and the work oh. from home works for me within the school hours and it being part-time as well. So I've got that window yeah. within. I think changes but when they're in school because obviously mine aren't in school yet. So. But even then, the summer holidays swing round and I'm lucky that Philip's got some flexibility, but he's still working. So we've we've used some summer camp type football, ballet and, and various different clubs to go to, but we're, we're paying for that um, f through the holiday. So yeah, I think there'll be for people clubs and, that and stuff. can't afford that. So mm. they then sacrifice. And for me, I'm in a lovely position that probably don't need to work, but it's not really about the income. So I've got to balance up whether they want a mum who's happy and using her brain for something other than them um yeah and but also around and th there's the so that's there's the the sickness as well that's about yeah, yeah. so <laughs> i'm just doing a little i'm just doing part-time cleaning at the moment that is just to get extra income to get me out of the house for my own mental health because i can't not work so that is just to get and because it i've chose that because it was the only flexible work i could find within sort of childcare hours um, and I can tend if one of them's sick, I can sometimes shift it, shift them around and do them another time. I'm not set to you have to be here at this time. Um, but a few weeks ago, they kept getting one bug after the other, which is what tends to happen when you put them in nursery. <laughs> they all just get bugs and they're sick like every other month or sometimes every <clears> month. <throat> and there was like two weeks of the month where I couldn't work. Um, and I remember just thinking like if I was at like a full time job, or, I, you know, I had a boss because I'm still classed as self-employed. Like, they wouldn't want me because I'm always calling it. It's like, not me calling in sick. Like, I have to call in sick because they're sick all the time because they're always getting bugs. Um, and then that, I I feel like pressured then because I say I don't like to let people down. And then that just adds to the pressure and, yeah. Definitely a juggle. Yeah, I think though employers are, are a little bit more um, accommodated accommodating of situation like that now though but only because they realize they can be because of the working working from home experience that the pandemic's taught you know what yeah I mean? that's the thing certainly my experience at my job is much more accommodative of people not who have to be in the office not being in the office because of x y z reason um i, I mean that, that i'm not saying it's, there's a solution there but no, like, and like, uh, yeah, not all and roles. And I feel like it is in, it's, company, company. it's improving. I feel like it's going in the right direction, but we're still like. A bit the problem behind. is as well, like, is where for driven individuals like yourselves, it's one thing. I'm, I'm, I'm making vast assumptions here, right? It's one thing getting a job, finding a job that you can do it. And uh, and that can be, fl for example, flexible. You need to be because it's a child situation or children's situation. And then it's the other one is your own desire. So okay, got a job now. Let's start moving up the chain, because then you have to compete against people who don't have to put up with those issues of of um, potentially not being at work for long periods of time, which majority of the case is men, because most of the time it's the men. That, yeah, it's the well, we just talked about it. Mums, m uh, women being mums. Um, very challenging. I don't envy. You. I don't. I don't envy either situation at all. <laughs> Yours as a single mum. Um, what? So in exploring, because uh, uh, I assume on your podcast you've explored some of these topics and and or a lot of these to all of these yeah. topics and uh -huh. talked around it. So what are the potential opportunities to improve the situations then, for like yourselves, mums, kids, challenge of um, juggling work and juggling um, the desire for a career. What, how can it be? Opportunities for what improvement. Improve? Yeah. Um, I think there's a balance to be had between the children's, how many, how long they have <coughs> off school and how much annual leave people get to sort of balance out a little bit. Problem there though, isn't it? Big problem Massive. There. Because that means that the profit making companies <laughs> provide the annual leave, have to provide more and then make less profit. And arguably. Or they change the model of working the way they work. And interestingly, schools, six weeks holiday, historically, was for all the kids to go and work on the farms and help with harvest in the summer. Was it really? I didn't know that. And it's by the religious calendar. 
Easter, Christmas. So uh, okay, yeah. there's potential for change. Oh, well, it's just such a massive system that's been around for so long. Mm. Yeah, if you look at like the, the childcare system that we have, so it is meant to be like the second most expensive. Um, and well, then the, if you come, yeah. Mm. So if you compare it to the likes of Germany, they have heavily subsidized childcare, and I think you can get it from like six months now. So they they have like almost like government type nurseries, and it's it you only pay like a small percentage, so it's a lot easier for them to go to work, and it's not like you know like a financial burden. <coughs> um, yeah, because it only starts from three in this country. The yeah, support. and you sometimes hear the argument oh. that... Oh, Which doesn't... Why, yeah. is it, why is it three years old? Doesn't link with any yeah, theory. Yeah, doesn't, doesn't seem Whereas to Whereas most people sense. from six months will be going back to work, uh, and that's after a good maternity package, six months to a year. Mm. And, yeah, and, and things with childcare, like, it is an investment into childcare because the, the, I think they did some American research that showed it did bring back a return like if you invest into childcare, and apparently that's now why Canada's just invested a few billion into its childcare system because they've worked out they get like more than double the return with the amount of people that, you know, can then work. What, like contribute into the GDP or something like that? Cause yeah, it's some yeah, so it, it was something like, for, I think in America it was for like every dollar you invest into childcare, you get like two point something dollars back. So um, probably in tax from the people working or... Yeah, they, I, have a, I don't know how they worked it out, yeah. but, you know, so when people are like, oh, like, well, we're not going to pay for, you know, like a child, for people to go to childcare, it's like, well, it, the research shows overall, it benefits the system overall. You get more money back in general. Makes sense. And that's what needs to be explored in this country because it, there is support and it's the sort of the free, uh, they call it free hours, 15 free hours to 30 free hours, depending on your income from age three. So a lot of people, I know when we were both serving, first children going back in at nine months to a year, depending on how much time you took off, you're paying full price nursery care or childminder or um, the equivalent, and there's no support. I think you can get, you know, there's tax so Tax, yeah, yeah the, um, you get you get so if you earn off this is the issue that I have. It's also complicated and working it out. It, and it's based on your earnings, so you can so at the minute I can get eighty five percent of the cost back, which is quite high, but that is only if I earn under a certain amount. So if I stay in low paid work, I can get the majority of the fees paid. If I go back to nursing, I wouldn't get that. And I wouldn't, but then I wouldn't be able to afford to pay the full this fees. This is one of the problems with the benefit system. So yeah, I'm not encouraging I anyone. I feel like, so I feel like I have been forced into low paid work in order to work. And it's so that, and yeah. it's, that is a bit mm. backwards. Yeah, it's one of the things I've realised, I say realised, I've come just come to my knowledge over the last, over the last few years is that, sort of so touching on that point, is that the benefit system, exi the benefit system for so, in some reasons exists, well, no, exists to support people who for some reason can't work. Maybe they're trying to find a job and they can't find a job. Maybe it's a childcare thing um, or some other reason. But also, for people who are trying to find work and can't find any or or not even that, the barrier to them going and getting a job is actually the benefit system. Because if they go and get a, a job, which is, for example, minimum wage, they actually it's a net loss. They're not mm. a net loss and then they can't afford stuff. They have to, they have to find a job, which is such a big jump up in salary or wages to what they're getting off the benefits that, to, you'd have to outweigh the tax, outweigh a lot of stuff for it to be pro not profitable, for them to make ends. Would be worth it, yeah. And it, or even ridiculous. the jump from okay, yeah, to get in and earn more, you might need to go in lower and work your way up. And then you look mm. at it and do the maths. Yeah, it's not even like oh, I'm gonna. It's not even someone actively thinking oh, I'm gonna be taxed more or I'm gonna um, technically. If it's for something like childcare cost. Is tax tax credit? Is that the wrong word? It's not. No, it's, it's the um, you get the tax free. It's element. the tax free. Yeah. So, so I worked out if I went back to my old nursing role and my old band six pay, I would have got the tax free element. So I'd have got twenty percent off the bill, but that still wasn't enough. I still wouldn't have earned enough to pay that. Pay for it in bill. the first place. Yeah. yeah. What about uh, childcare at work? I mean, any, any companies doing that? 
in an hour. Like a crash. Well. Apparently, yeah. there are some hospitals that have um, crashes there. But I've only just found out about that recently. It's not sort of like hugely wildly. Not, and I haven't, I haven't looked into that about whether they're free or paid for or what. I'm, yeah, I'm assuming think... you still have to pay for them. Um, but I mean, that would work if there was. I, I did think what well, well, what would work with nursing, and it would work if there was, yeah, like crashes at the hospital and. It works right until your child is in that crash. And there's, a, a li- and there's some other child there as a little bastard and happens to be the son or daughter <laughs> of your co-worker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Then, then you know. got drama. They never yeah. tell you the drama. name when they say that a child <laughs> bit your child. They yeah. don't tell you the name. Yeah. They're not yeah. allowed. Yeah. <laughs> but then I was thinking that still won't work with nursing and shift hours because I was thinking if you're on a late yeah, shift... Yeah, it's got to be open till... Like the kids, it'd have to be open till, what, 9? 9, 9 p.m. 10, 9, 10 o'clock? And then if you've got young children, their bedtime routine generally starts between, I know, seven yeah, and around seven. Well, that's that's nine. hospital specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. It, it in other places, yeah, it would be better. I suppose it's all company size and availability of money to get it started, isn't it? Because there'll be some small companies that are just like, where do we put it? How do we start it? There's only X amount of children, would it be? And then it, because it's a business within itself, mm. um, you've got to get it going. But the bigger ones could, but a yeah. smaller business. A room. Like uh, in yeah. my sat where I work, there's an activity room, which is it's a big it's room and they use for yoga, you use a different, it's just a big, it's an open room. And you need, I mean, this is a big company though, it's a room like that yeah. and an employee, you know. But then there's ratios per kid. It's all very complicated. Yeah, because then you go down. The, the then they need facilities oh and God. food. There's, 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 there's all their... I'm a bloke. Yeah, think about yeah it. their policies um, that they have. And uh, the ch- they are changing it, but I'm sure it's like... The only thing that would and be it good. depends on the age. Like, I think babies. Is babies like have a higher ratio. Two? They need cots for naps. It's a big... And then slightly older children, it's like four <laughs> per one person or something. Yeah. But it's an industry in itself, which I think the pandemic hit them hard as well. Um, I was reading about lots of nurseries are closing and therefore people have been given short notice that their nursery's closed and they're trying to work and then they've got to find new childcare in quite a quick turnaround. Oh, closing because the nurseries weren't getting used because kids didn't need to go there. And and some people going to work from home and being a bit more flexible um, so that... and, Mm. And then... Everyone's sort of going back to work and they're sort of having to step up their numbers again. Couldn't do it quick enough or people had left. And uh, lots and of people re-evaluated like their careers. The, the running costs going up and then having to pay. I think, yeah, one of yeah, that was, it was on the radio. It was the electricity bills and everything. Gas yeah. and electricity going up has had a knock-on effect to just some of the premises um, and paying for that. And they didn't want to put their prices up. Or they do put their prices up and then people are looking elsewhere. So it's all a bit of a perfect storm at the moment, I think. Well, that's a miserable little yeah, segment, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Move on. Yeah. <laughs> How did you guys meet? In, well, it'd be basic training. ATL Winchester. April 2002. Yeah. We would start off in the same platoon, but then I got I got back squatted, didn't I? But then we were in the same cohort of nursing. Oh yeah, I'd forgotten about yeah. that. Yeah. Did you so did you, so when did you when did you want to become no you want to become nurses? Or was it just uh I'm gonna join the military? Oh I can be a nurse. No, you join up as a nurse, but you do basic training before. So you do your twelve weeks basic training, knowing yeah. that you're gonna be cat badge as, as, as a, nurse. a nurse. Yeah. But the and way we joined up is that then you get paid to go to university as a private soldier for three years. Really? With, with um, oh my God. FIA, which was what, food, event, food and incidentals allowance. First cohort through so Birmingham. The, yeah, that's best why lives. called us like pop star wages and oh got paid God. to be students for three get years. Get corporal as soon as you qualify. <laughs> yeah. So, but that was the reason I, I looked at the army because I was looking to be a nurse and I was looking at universities and travelling and the costs of uni, do I have to get a part-time job? And then someone just said to me, like, have you thought about doing it in the army? Um, 
I was like, well, no, but there is like a recruitment center around the corner. So I was like, I'll go get a leaflet. <laughs> it's actually <laughs> the same. <laughs> Went to get a leaflet. They gave me the application forms. I was like, oh, I'll well, do the I'll be then. Um, yeah, and that, and that was it. I was just like, because I thought it sounded too good to be true at first, but they're like, they'll pay for your training and you'll get a wage. And I was like, sounds too good to be true but um no they, they were like people a, knock it don't they they people were a good it. three years like at the moment you see all the memes at the moment um we, you mentioned philly boots from before we started the podcast and you see i think they've just put a meme out you know it's uh it's something to do with people failing <coughs> people failing the gcses after the recruiting office to go and join up because nothing else can do when I, I was thinking about it see what Oh, but you know, fail, you the fail your GCSEs fun, yeah. and you go off there and then you're made to get your GCSEs. You're going to get, you're going to yeah. get your maths and English. Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? It's like, what? Well, it's, you it's, have to, uh, yeah. It's such a bad, I, I mean, it's funny. It's like, meanwhile, it's funny stuff. But it's such a bad example of, it paints the, the wrong picture of the military. You know, it's such a, uh, it's so much opportunity. I, I do think, back to, to your point, if you just focus on the money side of things, like on a university degree, like my youngest is thinking about joining, I mean, she's, she's only 13. But she, I say she's only 30, it's not far away, but she wants to join and she wants to go and have a professional job and she wants to do uni through the army. I think it's when she's through, I'm, I'm in my back of my head thinking, yeah, get in it. there because she won't, she won't come away with all that debt. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's just bonkers. And it's, um, yeah, it was definitely it. Yeah. The, the better option. Once I didn't get an order. What was the alternative? For the of you? Um, I failed my A-levels and my parents were both police officers and they said oh well you can always join the police and I was like I'm female with red hair I can't be a police officer I'll just get so I joined and the, you army. the army be right. and, and then yeah. I get to basic training I'm like they're just calling me ginge and I'm like oh praise the lord that's easy because some of the girls were getting called I mean I don't know what you got called oh, because fuck. some of the girls got called all sorts because they didn't have anything obvious and I was like I'm taking ginge Let's go because that's easy. I know. Yeah, yeah I have red hair. Oh, Thank freck, you. Freckle face. Oh, yeah. But there was a fairy few... poops. <laughs> yeah. Fairy. They said my freckles were fairy poops. <laughs> well, I've never heard that before. <laughs> I've got. Well, so <laughs> is this in is this in basic? Yeah. So we were. Were we one of the first ner- lot of nurses through Winchester? Yeah. So I think we, we were had one of all the first, infantry. We had all infantry um, staff. <laughs> yes, and they didn't quite know that, what to do. That with was us. interesting. Um, what? When was this? Early noughties. Yeah. Yeah, two thousand and two. But I think they've changed now. Two thousand two. Oh, yeah. yeah. I yeah. think they were. Well, I think they, ha- they had to change. I heard there was a lot of changes <laughs> once we well, left. I think <laughs> our platoon, they were a bit shocked and didn't know what to do with us, and were a bit soft. Then a few platoons ahead, they were too hard, and some of people got ill. Um, coming on off exercise. What do you mean? Like just being absolutely thrashed, but coming in like, you know, electrolytes out, like properly oh. ill, poorly. Um, and we were, I think, I just remember them being like, oh, do you lot do press ups properly or on your knees? Or like, and just asking us questions. And we were like, what? Like, we've, <laughs> what are you talking about? So I think they didn't know what they were doing with us. But um, I, I remember they told us, um, that they didn't like it when girls cried, so they were going to avoid that as much as possible. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I saw some, <laughs> some guys walk like this, but this we did instructors. Yeah, we yeah. did. We didn't choose. So in my platoon, often when there was a fresh in, we would get we would get them, but sometimes they would just do the blocks and they would like leave us to. That is a fascinating insight. Yeah. And yeah. I, I didn't choose that, that but that is what they chose to do. Because so change played... parade. Only the blokes did that. We didn't have. I never. We had never had a change parade. And I saw guys down the corridor, and I'd be like, "What are they doing?" I'd be like, what "Yeah, are they doing I'd, now? I'd, I'd see them. I'd see them we running didn't... up and down the football pitch, and be like, "What's yeah. going on? What What have they done?" Um, what thrashing the blokes, but not. Yeah, the and we yeah. were just all in our rooms ironing. Fascinating insight, isn't it? Especially when you consider the should women be on the front line. Yeah. And equality Qu- question, equity. which and, the, and and I mean, women are on the front line and have been for a long time. Like medics, I, I remember when I went to Afghan the first time, and we had a clerk, and the clerk would stay in Bastion, and we went out for one up, and we brought the clerk. Do you want to come? She said, "Yeah." She went out in the up, and it turned into a bigger than better. It was a big old, big old contact, and uh, she was ginger. Funny enough, <laughs> part of the gingers, right? Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's like you got the question of should women be on, women be on the front line. 
uh, which they are, but on on mass. So should, so should women be in infantry units, for example? And one of the things that comes up is the psychological impact that has on blokes. And that, and I think that gets swept aside as if no, no, that's not relevant. It fucking is relevant. As mm. The example there, like not not being comfortable with women crying. I probably said it tongue in cheek, half joking, but it is absolutely something in the impact that the opposite sex has on uh, on you Definitely. when you experience extreme <laughs> emotion. Because it's probably the same for w- when a man a man has extreme emotion, the impact that has on the woman, the woman has on a man. It's different, different, especially a, a negative emotion. You know, and can impact yeah. uh, tactical, um, and tactical you have to capability, think of, maybe. Of, like, relationships forming as well, because that happens naturally. And you have to think, yeah. that is that <clears throat> that's going to impact if someone's having a secret relationship with someone, that surely they're naturally going to want to look out for them. But they're going to make different decisions yeah, to protect gonna, it, each other. And even make... if it's not been labelled as a relationship, people are going to have... You protect your mates, obviously, you're always, and you're going to be close, but it's just... It's, yeah, it's a different type of feeling. Yeah. yeah. I, I always felt whenever people ask that when serving and then afterwards is that if I wanted to, I could have become still as a nurse, qualified in a emergency medicine type way and got to the front line. I'm happy that there was that pathway. Had I wanted to take it, I didn't. Um, so I was happy that women can be on the front line. I didn't feel any need to try and push it to being a full member of an infantry sort of battalion cat badged fully whatever cat badge you want to be i didn't feel there's the need for that because i could have done it if i wanted to in my capacity it'd be interesting to know what a female royal engineer or um other cat badge that didn't have well does have the trade to get up there but is but not with you know, our role meant we could have gone up there. There were some roles where there isn't any job to be done right on that front line. Mm. The only, pro- I just thinking about that, the females on the front line thing. The only problem I had, I ever experienced a negative way, apart from there was obvious, like I say, obviously there was there was times when there was relationships had with um, on ops with um, female people who were, who were attached to whatever unit I was with at the time. Um, but the only problem I ever remember having it, and it wasn't because it was a woman, it was because it was an attached arm. And uh, it just happened to be a woman in this position. And I can't remember what role they were doing. What role were they were doing. It was, it was, uh, it was key leader, not key leader engagement, it was female engagement. They were in, there was two ladies in the female engagement role. I can't remember what unit they were. They may have been part of the ink or something like that. But they had, they, their, their fitness um, standards had not been applied as in British Army fitness standards, not been applied as, as rigidly to that unit, wherever they came from, to infantry and especially to power edge who we were serving with on this particular, this particular time. And people kind of pay lip service to that um, when you're in a training environment or a non-operational environment. The, the example there of the guys getting thrashed and you guys weren't. Now that's partly because you're women, but it's also partly because they were probably off to infantry units and you guys weren't, so it's perceived as not as important. But I remember being on a on a patrol and it was a really like it was a dangerous situation, it was a dangerous area, real real heightened chance of getting slotted. And we had to cross this big bit of open ground. And I was the rear person, because I was a platoon sergeant at the time, and I was the rear person. And we had two ladies attached to us from again, it wasn't because they were ladies, they attached to us from a unit, but their fitness standards were not up to infantry level at all and it, by any way shape was standard and we were crossing this open ground and it took everyone got across and it took them an age it took them an age massive gap formed and i'm behind them it just the, and the danger was that they were the ones who were going to get shot or oh, i was going to be myself yeah just dragged it right out but that's more again that is more to the fact that the standards fitness standards need to be applied across the board not necessarily like tactical standards and tactical awareness and tactical ability at the basic stage which everyone gets taught but certainly the fitness standards are maintained throughout because uh it just compromises everyone anyway but i run off a time yeah yeah no so in terms of that so we so in well i know they don't do pfts anymore but so we had a different p we did have a different standard as nurses like a different pft time to to pass and i think if you're going to go into the infantry role, then yes, you have to be able to meet that standard that you do. But if it was my problem when they say, oh, it should be the same across the board, is you'd wipe out a lot of nurses. You'd wipe out <laughs> a lot of If I had to army. meet the infantry standard, I wouldn't have. 
I wouldn't have no, been able but to be a nurse. To go and do that, I role, wouldn't have been able to pass. Even the, the uh, even the female engagement. That is the failure of whoever chose those people to go. Is that I think if you're going to go out there and do that, you need to be able to keep up with them. So it's who yeah. you put. Yeah, so it's, it's who, who, who they put forward because obviously there are. I know, like a lot of extremely fit women yeah. who, who will put their hand put up men, and want to go and yeah, say, "Yeah, you're." Sometimes yeah. put men to shame, and they'll be at the front, and they're the ones who should go. Um, and if I think in that situation, probably they did have much choice, and he was going to go because there weren't many of them. One of them yeah. was very overweight, but, but that's, and you get the same. Again, I don't, it's not because they're women. You get the same with blokes. You get people yeah. attached. And you go, what the fuck are you doing? here? this is a nightmare. But on your on the point of you, you lose a lot of nurses. You would if you certainly imp- if you all of a sudden impose that that standard upon at the end of it if you if if the training was started off with the intent that you're going to get to this point and be this fit at the end of it at like genuine basic army standards no bluff you're going to be doing a, a cft in a mile uh, one hour 50 or whatever it was back then and the bft because all that's gone now isn't it and all the rest of that yeah stuff. well the fact it is, uh, has gone now where yeah. Yeah, it wasn't so much it was the pft time i struggled to get down i remember that the mile and a half pft P- Personal oh, the BFT, BFT. Yeah. So B, then, then yeah. P. Your mile, yeah, your mile and a half. Now it's called something right, completely different. So yeah. They do half, something completely up, different now. But yeah, I remember I, I did really struggle to get that, all on the that time bike down. And, everything now. And, and I was in, like, my last unit was Colchester as well. So that was like yeah, so you did a bit of the, the most fit unit. And Where I, were you at Colchester? Uh, 16 Medreg. Oh, okay, yeah. So nursing-wise, that's one of the... So that is like... Fit, yeah, the, like the everyone fittest, goes. The fittest you, only, you only go there if you're fit, and if you, you go there go unfit, there. you leave fit, or you end up being fit. Or you leave with an injury. No, anyway. <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I mean, I did get fitter when I was there, but I did struggle to sort of like get to that. I don't, there's no way I didn't get anywhere near that top standard. Um, I got fitter in my own respects, but I found it diff- I would have found it difficult to to get to that level fitness yeah i'm just trying to think what you said if if you had i don't know how long it actually takes because i know that when we were leaving at the 12 week point there were definitely a few people that had done all the same build-up training as us but still weren't quite making the mark and whether that's just got to get over it yeah. psychologically some I people just then, can't I think back then as well those I fitness think standards I'd... were based on men weren't they so thinking about it you know the, the 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 amount of weight you carry and all the rest, the amount of weight you carry, the times you were doing for the CFT, the combat related stuff, that's all on the. Well, I know oh, they changed no, it, and it is to do with like, um, yeah, so like the differences in your body as well. So there's the, they did know that you have to do with the weight that you carry and the certain speeds that you go. Um, like women are more likely to get sort of like pelvic injuries and fractures and shin splints, and that was more likely to happen. Um, and towards the end of my basic training, I was I did start getting pains in like my pelvis Most and stuff. Most people had shin splints. A lot of people, yeah, girls had shin splints. I know, fracture, and and that's why they changed things slightly because, like, women were getting injured. More yeah. women were getting injured. I think it was just two thousand two. It, the rumblings of it, ch- the change was starting, um, and then it's probably through our whole career. As uh, definitely as I was leaving, they were talking about the what bites. Uh, using the bikes and fitness and measuring it, you know, and even Pilates and yoga and stretching, like the whole fitness um, world has realised that it's all doing loads of different things. I think PTIs and fitness and that was was evolving as we left. So hopefully it's a little bit, bit better. But yeah, I'd forgotten about that in basic training of actually... Equality in no the op- complete opposite of equality, but to the detriment of the men than the women in yeah. our basic training. What's the worst memory when you served? Oh wow! Oh, children nursing yeah. children in Afghanistan. Oh god! That yeah. that's yeah. that yeah absolutely yeah worst was yeah. Afghan and, and I hadn't had children then. I don't know if I. I don't think had I, I do it now. gone and I was prepped to go again actually when I did have one and then I fell pregnant with number two so I didn't go on tour and I think um I don't know if I could have done that again no being a mum 
I was actually thinking about that in the car on the way down. <coughs> um, yeah, like my worst experience. And that was the first sort of, yeah, like child amputee that I saw. Um, and think I'd, I wouldn't be able to do that now. Like what had just children. happened to just just being the victim? So Coming into the... Co- so, I, so I, yeah, so I was like, I was an emergency care nurse. So that was in the trauma department. So that was... And them. they'd just been blown up coming into the department yeah and what i learned that so sometimes like body parts are still attached but not you can't save them and they just cut them off in there um and that was my first experience and that yeah i thought about that for yeah it took me a while to process that i looked so. after a little girl with 30 percent burns um how old but she was healing well we didn't know her date of birth. Um, they thought she was probably three, but I, she was tiny, just like malnourished, tiny. I could, I held her. I was the only. <coughs> yeah, we we were split into two teams, and actually, I there were two men, a medic and a nurse in my team. So I was the female. So it's like default. You're looking after the little baby. Um, so I looked after her, and then it's just afterwards when, like. I wish someone had never told me, but apparently she got discharged, um, but then came back in and sadly didn't make it. And I'm like, why did you tell me? Why, why did you pass that story on to me? So like, I don't even know if that's true, but it's mm. like, don't tell me that. <laughs> mm. she, apparently she's not, uh, she didn't make it. So it's like, but just that life out there, what they, what those kids were. And it was, yeah, and it was just difficult because we got told before as well, like the, the children don't cry and won't show like much emotion. So that was... She didn't cry. The, uh, we, I didn't what see you any... Genu- what do they mean? Child- Afghan children? Yeah, Afghan children, okay. like, don't cry. Yeah. So I never saw them crying. There was one who came in, he'd been shot in the stomach, and he was talking about it, matter of fact. What kid? Yeah, and almost like, he was, like, kicking off a bit. He was like, nah. he was saying he's been shot in the stomach. Not showing <laughs> any, any signs of yeah, pain. Yeah, no signs of pain, no yeah. emotional distress. He, was, he, he seemed more of, like, a bit of noise. Yeah, we just routinely than anything. Gave her, it's probably a cultural thing. Yeah, yeah, her, yeah, and I think yeah, that that's yeah. We, yeah, we learned that that is like yeah, it's obviously like a cultural thing. Um, and maybe just learning to be quiet, um, with all that's going on in their country is like don't draw attention. Well, on the women's front, on, on the women's front, like a national front. Oh, the women. <laughs> no, on the on the women's side, you know, they 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 they're very oppressed, aren't they? Aren't yeah. They? So it's uh, yeah, keep keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Well, on the on the bloke side, it's mm. uh, on the boy side, it's very outspoken, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I and the reason I asked that question is that I, one of the things I've I don't know why I, I, I struggled with it. I struggled with it. I was never comfortable. Um, I always found it challenging. Though the mo- thing I found most challenging was learning first aid, first first basically first responder, first aid stuff, military and outside of the military. You know, knew the basics, learn the basics, especially the, you know the the role I was in, but was never comfortable comfortable with it. Um, happy treating, but never to. A, I always thought in the back of my mind, as only so far I could I could learn this and be able to apply it effectively, because it's like a, it's like black magic to me. Anything to do with treating <laughs> treating humans, it's like it's like it is like a black art, like black magic. It's so complex because you got the you've got the physical side of things you've got the emotional side of things trying to interpret everything then you're trying to balance your own understanding of what's going on your own emotional response and that's where I think was it on the was it on the icebreaker at the start of this you were talking oh it was on the icebreaker and we were talking about because crisis things yeah and you came across someone who'd fallen off a bike and had a heart attack but your training kicked in and you were you were you were it's automatic. talking to yourself in your head yeah. Incre- the power of like training and repetition that knowledge is, is incredible but going back, I could never be a fucking nurse. <laughs> I could never be a paramedic. I could never be a medic. Couldn't do it. Couldn't. But do I think it. that's it. Is you, and that's why three years at uni, you, you learn then whether you can or you can't, and you also learn your areas. Y- yeah, you uh, learn your areas you, as well. So what e- areas you can even you thrive within in. nursing, there are people that will avoid those emergency situations. I obviously went towards that because I was an emergency care nurse. That was the area that I liked and that I thrived in. But you'd still you still get areas in nursing where, you know, there's a cardiac arrest on the ward. 
That's it. I went away from like, it. Oh, There's more ward based. They'll move away from it. They'll, yeah, and they'll, they'll realise, oh, actually, my place is on the ward. I like working on the ward for different reasons. Whereas me, where oh, I was drawn to it, I was like, oh, oh, maybe I should go work in A&E. And, and I preferred, um, yeah, the A&E environment. Because mm. I took a lot of roles away from nursing as well. And I did, um, I did platoon commanders in training per bright as a in the training regiment. So I came away from nursing a bit and did some roles. So I never specialised because I was always sort of jumping out into different roles and then sort of back to hospital and back. So there's yeah, just so, so many different things you, you can, can do. Because you could specialise in the army as well. You could do specialist nursing. So I went into specialist emergency care and you could get specialists intensive care as well and then i think you could specialize you could do on the orthopedics the yeah, yeah within yeah. so that's still the case now yeah, yeah. i think and probably even more so i think you probably well. encouraged we were always encouraged from the beginning really to, to, to specialize to specialize in something um but i just didn't didn't quite know what to specialize in so tried different things and i did um headley court that was good posting sort of from that side of it and that was um interesting to see i didn't see anyone exactly f who i met on tour but what year you then see uh what years 2013 to 14 so that was interesting having done 2007 herrick six on tour that then that sort of six seven eight years later oh you went out just after me yeah so we yeah, yeah um seen a lot Is of guys come through you're Oh seven. No, what what tour did you? Um, oh no, slightly uh, later. Sixteen, Herrick sixteen, and Alpha and seventeen. Alpha, sorry, I'm gonna get the date. Two thousand and twelve, I think it was. Mm. Oh, it was, I was. That was quite later on. Yeah, I I'd, did an early one. I just done because I went back because I had to go back to uni for a period to do the emergency care specialist. Um. So again, that's and then by not specialising, I deployed early. And then once I qualified in that, then I got deployed as, as an emergency care nurse. Do the qualifications lapse when you leave? Only if you don't practice. Yeah. How long? For not practising. So you, you have to renew your registration yeah. every three years, don't you? But and you have to have a, done a certain amount of hours and professional development work and stuff. So I left in... 2018 and then when pandemic 2020 i signed i'd just lapsed i didn't renew my registration so i wasn't going to work and then i signed <coughs> on to the covid register because it was all kicking off and they were going to be short of nurses and everything and everything everyone was like i thought well i better i better had like if this is, no one knew quite what was going to happen um so i thought i better be ready if like we run out of nurses and Every, everyone needs to get going um, and then looked into it locally um, to do any work and because I had the kids in the end it didn't work so I didn't do anything but I stayed on that COVID register so when I was looking at work um, I was looking at sort of renewing because I was still on the COVID register I could have done like a return to practice course and got back to it but if you leave and go straight into a job then you're, all your mm. quals go with you but yeah, so so I went straight into had a, a job. A gap. I went into it was it was an assistant resuscitation officer. So I taught um, sort of like basic life support, <coughs> paediatric life support to the trust. Um, but it was in that job that I got pregnant, and then started thinking about different career choices. And I wasn't enjoying the job as much as I thought it would. would. So then I left, and I just did agency work um, instead. But then now. I have left like quite a period of time where my registration has lapsed, didn't have enough hours. So to go back, I would have to do a return to practice now, which I think is like six months to a year long. But that's a big thing in the recruitment process, uh, the sort of recruitment sales pitch for nursing is that, yeah, you what everything is Civvy Street translated. Like it is yeah. civilian qualification. So as soon as you leave, and lots of people go, oh, you, you know, when they say about get a trade, um, or have a, you can leave and just, yeah, that's it. You are an NHS equivalent nurse. Yeah, you can, so it you is, can be um, sort of set up for life, really. And they do sort of like snap you up. So when I went for my job mm. interview, um, 
I was offered it straight away. And the there was an A E matron on there and said, Do you want to apply for <laughs> we're looking for um, yeah. we're looking for an A E sort of matron. Can you know, can we have you? Yeah, it's quite and she was like quite she was good. like, No, nope, she's mine. Yeah. Um and I got offered the job like straight away when even though people were saying, Oh, you'll struggle to get a job and it's like mm. Yeah, d- so it wasn't it wasn't difficult. For me anyway. Just a shame that then the childcare don't fit in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you'd like to th- like to think that it's just a, a lapse at the moment, right? A little lull, maybe a lull in the battle. Go back into whatever you want to get into. Um. Hopefully. <laughs> what 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 are your memorable achievements when you were serving? What sticks in your mind is yeah, pat my back for that one. Did really well there. Come on, bit of boasting. <laughs> oh, I don't know. See, I always liked a good parade square. It was both my pass oh outs, my like basic the training, parade square, basic training in Sandhurst. I was yeah. I, was, I, I know, did this, quite this like really boring bit but of a bit of the band, <laughs> the pass off day. <laughs> but then, but we didn't do it. So when we did it, we were like, ooh. <laughs> but then you're nursing, the nursing graduation. Maybe it's just that's when you stop and go. This is pretty cool. When rather than actual marching, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Just I think there's like yeah different methods. So yeah, there was out of basic training, graduating from uh, nursing. Then me it was like do become an emergency care specialist nurse as well because I've been battling a bit to get onto that path. I've been bugging them for ages, and you have to do placements. You have to get recommendations. You have to go to a selection board for that as well. So once I got that. That was that I felt that was quite an achievement, and then putting it into practice as well, like actually out doing that in Afghanistan. I thought um, maybe I was a bit of a drill geek because it was um, pair bright as well, <laughs> passing out with my recruits. I was like, I'm a nurse. I will always say I didn't feel real army, but I was at pair bright and I was being a platoon commander and with an awesome. Um, training team who they know and I know carried me through it <laughs> um, <laughs> we did it and I was I, f- I was not a nurse then I was a platoon commander and um, f- as a QA yeah. we're, we're, we are brushed off as just nurses quite a lot I feel like those those minor things they might seem like minor yeah to you but they, I suppose like as nurses they're quite big to us because the the one thing we always used to say was well you're a soldier first nurse second and in my head I was like no we're, we're actually nurses first I had a go at being a soldier but I wasn't I wouldn't say I yeah. was like a good amazing <laughs> one I had my moments but I was like I was a nurse first so if you did uh, have any minor achievements in soldiering let's say it was like that was a slightly yeah. bigger achievement because you're a nurse is whereas that, you're that? like you want to get that out of the way because you want to get out there and get well, some when you said <laughs> get some, <laughs> get some. Cool. when you said drill square i thought you meant when you were in when you were in training but you were talking about when you well, were no, in commander initially like my pass off you think well that's cool i've got through that i'm still alive and then obviously and um, within the qas i commissioned so i did it again short course i know but i was on santa's drill square um parade square but yeah per bright um and i think you got it you yeah in, in it, a nutshell there where it's quite low expectations yeah. of nurses when it comes to soldiering so if you do per manage bright. to do it or excel at it or it's like seen as like a bit of an achievement yeah. isn't it whenever you're per bright well i hate that place but also deep cut what was going on at deep cut what was going on at deep cut what do you think? I, d- <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't but get into that. Interestingly, having, having into gone it. to Perbright, um, you do all the training before you even get recruits. You do a whole um, sort of welfare training piece about the work. You got, you got youngsters coming through, so there's a lot of training. And I actually downloaded and tried to read the report from Deep Cut because they look a lot into it. How many? How many died? Quite a few, isn't it? Yeah, I, I can tell. I don't wouldn't want to get the number wrong, but there was a 
Yeah, there was a and an all suicides purportedly. Allegedly, yeah. Um, and it sounds as if, and obviously, reports always going to. I always think like it's like government reports, isn't it? It depends who's doing the report, what angle they were going for, but <coughs> it's d- obviously a definite failure <laughs> in care for sort of the younger. There is a trend though with, and I don't know if this has anything got got anything to do with that, but I know there is a trend in like copycat suicides and that's why it's never really reported on in the media, especially the details they don't report on it because there is statistics to show that it creates a bit of a, it can create a bit of a copycat oh, trend. Oh, like the detail of how it's done. Yeah, and then it tends to have a slight n- knock-on effect in that area with... That age that group. Mate? Yeah. So but I don't know if that's anything yeah. to do with that, the, the, but the, I know that is an issue. Yeah. The, the main is, thing that came out was bullying. Big bullying. Both uh, peers and DS. But the thing is, a deep cut is military establishment, right? It's not like you've got the same... It's not like the same community of people, the same mindset there of recruits and staff over the period of time that the, the suicides happened. Because this wasn't, didn't happen over no, the yeah, two year window. It wasn't like, uh, you know, dodgy CO, just a, a catalogue of dodgy hierarchy or inept hierarchy and also a cohort of recruits who happened to be of this, I don't know, background, mindset, certain a period in history where yeah. they were more vulnerable for whatever reason. It's really strange. It happened over what four, five, six years. It wasn't two years, was it? It was. It was a lot of years. It happened over. Oh, am I wrong in remembering? I'd say. I'd say I'm hazy. Three now years, yeah, four years. Yeah, yeah, I'd have to have a read again. Or maybe it was a. It really was a poor, period of a really time. Bad um, and there were, you know, they were all called Sergeant X, and you know. Captain Y in in the way in so the I wonder if it was, it was over a short period of time that was a, I remember then. Because that would make sense what you were both saying, actually. You know, with that sort of a failure copycat sort of mindset, I'm not happy, I'm going to top myself because Joe Bloggs did it. And also then, maybe he did have a bunch of bad apples in that training establishment and perhaps that bad environment carried over over a couple of new postings, new people in. Yeah. I think also, having read a bit more into it, there was, it was like a holding, a holding area for people who were waiting for courses or who'd failed some courses. So there was like, like a, a combination of Maybe it was people like a combination waiting, of factors. Fe- feeling like they failed, mm. um, wanting to move on to the next step maybe feeling like the army wasn't for them but they couldn't leave yet mm. and and it sounds as if it was awful situation there's obviously families and people yeah affected by it but it's just yeah it was very interesting to read i wanted to read it but hence why i got the report and had a good week because i want it was touched on within the training and mentioned um like you just did and i thought i need to read a bit more about it um, but again, that was a long time ago, so I'm hazy with the details. But um, yeah, why did uh, why did the podcast come about? How did that come about? What was the decision behind kicking off just a mum podcast? Well, so so you it was had it your page, didn't you? Yeah, so it was initially my idea. So I just wanted to start a podcast. Um. And I got the idea a while back and I started looking into it. And then I think it was just like imposter syndrome and nerves. I abandoned it for a bit. And then um, I just got to a point where I was like, you know, like life's a bit too short. I need to, if I want to do something, I just need to do it. Like, and I wanted to do it. So started it. But again, I think I was still a bit, you know, like nervous about starting one. So I thought, well, I'll do guess. Claire, a Claire was a willing guest <laughs> um, and then it just evolved as oh why don't you co-host yeah well we'd been you, you, you're you just a mum doing everything Instagram yeah so I've you? got like you kind of did that on the back of your Etsy. yeah so I've just carried it on from and your yeah my Etsy shop and everything else and so you were kind of doing that thing 
trying to build a profile. Yeah, so I was already book, kind of you? building a profile from that anyway. And then I just thought... I was like, I can come on as a guest. I, I, I haven't got a thing. <laughs> but we'd been but sort of back in contact, having not really... Well, not been in contact since before we really left. Um, yeah. And we'd always like chat in the DMs or I had children... Uh, your children are a little bit younger than mine, so you'd be sharing things, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Mine are getting older <laughs> now. <laughs> um, and sort of you've got to laugh or you'll cry about mum life. And, um, yeah, so when you said you were going to do a podcast, I was like, oh, I love podcasts. I listen to loads. Would love to sort of, yeah, like without sort of saying, yeah, I'd love to be a guest, but I don't, I'm not, yeah, bring, so I'm not like, I don't know what I'm bringing to the party. It's interesting. My perception of pod, people who listen to podcasts is that it's mostly blokes is it so but then when when no, i'm speaking yeah, to you so guys massive... thinking, maybe lots of housewives listen pardon for my assumption <gasps> maybe yeah it, no there's loads yeah. of because there's whatever you want when you talk about it's niches whatever area you want to go into you can search there's, there's lots of so when we've been looking at niche like what area do we cover there's a lot of parenting podcasts so for us to go in the top parenting podcast that'd be really difficult because there's a lot of them um so we so, were like, really, we, the veteran, female veteran. So yeah, I don't, a, there's not. So yeah, and when I looked at, um, yeah, sort of like veteran podcasts, I was like, do we go down that avenue? That we, we couldn't find any female UK ones. Depends what the intent is though, right? Like what's the intent? What well, and that's what, with the podcast? and that's where we still are really in our early days. I think for Rachel, it was like, you had your Etsy, um, and your book and you were forming that profile that people do for your business um yeah i think we've a, a, one of the issues that keeps cropping up is obviously like mental health yeah. like our for our own mental health but also for we obviously we, we do want it to benefit and help other people some you know so even and we were saying even if you don't sit and do oh here's like five tips for we prefer it when we just listen to people's stories and then we can sort of like pull things from that and their experience and go, oh, that, well, I've never tried that before. And so we, that's... It's a bit like our therapy our... in that we chat once a week and put it out there and hopefully people will listen and go, well, there's two mums that... And it's not even, it doesn't have to be set like, oh, who had careers, had their children and now find their way back into the workplace, trying to juggle a podcast their kids childcare, chatting about stuff going on road trips to come on this podcast you know meeting up again after yeah you know it's just we chat i tell you a podcast i love um be sober podcast which i looked at started listening to when i was looking drinking less alcohol or no alcohol and it was just two mates chatting about when they used to party all the time and then decided to give up alcohol together. And they just used to chat and tell stories, not even necessarily about drinking in the end. And theirs has evolved. It's grown. They've obviously got more of a thing. But what I liked about it, it was two mates talking. And I think, yes. Yes, we, we kind need to of find we, a thing. We went in without a plan, but that's kind of like... if It's evolving. Uh, yeah, to, but... The plan was to just let it evolve because <laughs> I know if, if I think of far, too far ahead and too many details and I, I know I won't do something, I know I've just got to start it. If I want to do something, I have to like just take that first step and get it done. And, and then, you might not have started it. Yeah, I might if... not have started it if I'd have thought about the details too much. So it was like, let's just start and let's just see how it goes and how it evolves. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this common themes coming out isn't there that yeah we do it's definitely I think it's definitely mother's mental health is a definite theme yeah there's a lot around yeah because that isn't it's well, not that's a fascinating topic to me as well it's not something that's like talked about a lot especially things like because one I said like postnatal anxiety like I didn't even know that was a thing until I got it like the it, the warnings were all postnatal depression. Do this, take if you look out for the signs. Well, you're gonna cry on day three, but then it's fine. You'll get the baby blues like, right. and <laughs> yeah. speak to your health visitor. I'd never heard of postnatal anxiety. Um, so when I got it after my first, I didn't know that's what it was, and I didn't tell anyone. 
because I thought I was going insane and I thought if I told someone what was happening, um, you know, they'd be like, well, we're taking your baby away, you know. And then <laughs> but that was one of that was one of like, you know, the symptoms of it. And then when I eventually did Google it, I was like, oh, like it's quite common this. And then if you find little pockets on the internet, women talking about it, which in some instances was like a lifesaver because I was like, I'm not the only person who experienced in this. Um, yeah, but then I'm just like, well, why is it not more talked? Why is it not more commonly known? Why did I not know about it? And equally, it doesn't have to be labelled. It's just the day-to-day -day mother's mental health of just making sure that you are... Yeah, because I don't really like the phrase of, like, you know, you, you've got to be OK to make sure the others are OK, but... Ultimately, it is. You can't care for everyone else if you're if if you're not looking after yourself. Um, and if that is just making time to chat um, once a week, um, or uh, and amongst other things, exercise and doing something that you know, even the going back to work piece, it's just doing something else that isn't being a mum, just a mum. Mm. I see similarities in the situation that. So the situation that mums have, and particularly uh, mums who don't have, so f your example as a single as a single mother, um, or or parents who are like poverty stricken, right? Or, well, focus on the mum at the moment, right? Because I and it, it struck me as having similarities to uh, military commanders in the front line. And the reason I say that is because a military commander on the front line has got no choice but to get through the situation they're in because they have subordinates reliant on them. They've got zero choice. So uh, the way I think it, uh, I've always thought, uh, and always thought, I thought over the last five, ten years that the people who are most impacted later on in life, military later on in life by uh, emotional um uh, emotional experiences when they're serving if they're going to be impacted are are the people who who had responsibilities that didn't let them th think about the f fear at the time or the consequences of what they could be doing generally commanders because they've got tactics to think about they've got subordinates to think about they've got the bigger picture the, the mission the plan or all the rest of it right um and i liken that to the the example of a mother it's like i think about some mums who like well, you know, there's mums who are like juggling a million kids. They've got a, they've tied down a million jobs. They've got four or five different ex partners who are all bastards, all trying to kill her. And and somehow, and somehow, they're keeping it all together. They go, how the f how? Because if that was a bloke, they'd be having a meltdown. <laughs> they'd be having a meltdown. But the reason is because they don't have a choice. They don't have a choice. Yeah. It goes back to the difference mm. between a mother, a, a man and a woman, a mother and a father. There is a difference in the way the parent. And that's not to say the man they left with the parents and the mother and the, and the woman, but they just there's a different it's a different thing, and a mother does in their mind. And I'm <laughs> I'm not in your mind. This is the way I see it. Is they don't have a fucking choice. They've got they've got no choice but to get through it. But every so often there's a chink in the armor, and every so often stuff comes to the forefront and they have a breakdown or they have a whole weekend crying away at themselves or they substance abuse over drinking of alcohol or just not looking at themselves eating like shit or really angry what you know all these things mm -hmm. much more than what i do you know but again similarities between that and the experience of a of someone who's experienced something frontline and hasn't had to think about it and now later on there's a there's a chance there's an opportunity to have to think about it and it all comes fucking crashing down it's the same thing i think it's the same thing because uh and that's why i think it's not spoken about maybe because Perhaps in the past it's frowned upon, you know, maybe for a, for a woman to be complaining or be struggling with the idea of being a mother. Well, be a mother, it's your fucking job. It's normal. You shouldn't yeah. find it no, natural. I agree with that. And I, th I do still see some of that now. Like if you complain about some of the struggles, it's like, well, you chose to be a mother. And it's a bit like, yeah, but I mean, does that doesn't make the problems that are there go away. Um, and if... And we, we always go down to like, it's it's down to your basic needs being met. Like everybody has needs that have to be met. And when you become mother, you 
forget about your own needs and you, you yeah your primal instinct is to meet all the needs of the child um but what i've learned is part of meeting their needs is also meeting my own um and by me actually abandoning them that's probably more detrimental to them but whereas if i'm a lot healthier and happier if i meet my own needs as well and then i know that that will make them healthier and happier and i've had to that's been a learning experience for me because for some reason i just slipped into this i don't matter like and i can just pour myself into them and do everything for them i you know stop going out I, I, well i don't work out anyway but <laughs> <laughs> but i did enjoy certain 16, things you ruined that. yeah i mean but there are, were other things that I would have liked to have done, you know, as I don't mind like a little bit of yoga and stuff like that. But I just kind of like shoved everything to the side. And now I'm just trying to pull some of that back because I'm realising this isn't just for me, like this is for them as well. And part of that is doing this, doing but the I think, podcast. Like um, I we, just noticed my, an improvement in my mental health, my own happiness. And then that has a knock-on effect on them. If I'm happier and calmer, so are they. Um, yeah, I think that's less to do with the fact it's a podcast, but more, but more to do with because I experience a similar thing with this positive benefits from this. I think, but I, for me anyway, I think it's more to do with the fact that I'm having conversations with people and doing some emotional exploration, really, and so I have a better understanding of myself, which has probably been one of the biggest impact the podcast had on me. From because when I started it, I was in an absolute shocking place mentally, terrible, 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 and I'm not in that place. And a large reason for that is probably the same benefit you find is I'm sitting down and talking to people and listening whether it's you you two at the same I've had repeat guests on I'm talking to someone every week about mm. lots of different topics but a lot of the time yeah. I'm, I'm forced to think about my own situation mentally professionally personally whatever and it's a, it's an understanding you know and it, it how many people get that opportunity these days or give yeah. or, or give themselves the opportunity yeah. these days you just don't do it and it's a, such an important thing to do the, Most the people, big, yeah. The big thing I think is, I think it's it's adult contact as well. So mm. the other thing I've learned is, um, especially with children, you need that adult contact. So I remember, like before children, hearing like mum say that they felt lonely with the baby, and I remember having thoughts like, "How can you be lonely with your baby? Like, how can you be lonely with your children?" And then I had one, and I was like, "Oh." <laughs> right yeah. i haven't spoken out loud yeah for two and, days yeah. and then i just realized how important it is to have that adult contact um, and and whether you've got children or not i know people who sort of like during the lockdowns who lived on their own mm. suffered a lot because they didn't have that regular adult contact um so i think that is yeah that's like hugely important definitely and a lot of people don't, uh, probably half joking, half serious, that it's like therapy, but a lot of people don't seek counselling. Therapy is an American word, isn't it? Seek counselling until they've had a massive breakdown or something really bad happens. So actually just talking. I've always been happy to talk. Uh, that's why we're still here now. But um, but to just, yeah, get get stuff out and even just you asking questions i've talked we've talked about things that we didn't think we were going to touch on because you've just asked a question that's made us go oh the manosphere and that's the manosphere for one I yeah. yeah we went down a rabbit hole at the start of this podcast we do mm. need to start wrapping it up i'm looking yeah. at the time I'm conscious <laughs> of you guys traveling <laughs> yeah um right just a mum podcast where can it be found so on instagram we've got uh, uh, yeah we've got a page on instagram um that's the Just a Mum podcast. Then it's on Apple iTunes and Spotify as well. A link yeah. in the bio of the Instagram page. I'll put the, well, the link so will be we in can, the blurb yeah, of this, we can this, do all the links. this episode. So if, if you look at the blurb um, of this, it'll be there. Yeah, I'm trying to be consistent, trying to get out there. I think we, um, we're sticking to sort of every other week at the moment, aren't we? Putting something out. Um, yeah. But it's, it's constantly evolving. We're open to, we've had one guest on. We are thinking of having like more guests on. Um, Mix it up. Um, yeah. Well, do what feels right and what... See, yeah. at the moment, you're not pressuring yourselves with it. But see, people go into podcasts 
and they and they go i think and they go right gonna do this and uh, it's gonna generate money and income and i'm gonna be fucking loaded and and it's the, like it's the wrong way of going about it um i think unless you are no, in the industry already like in so you know to your point just try and keep That's enjoying it. it try and keep yeah. enjoying it and it's not you know it's a compliment in you you're not morons right so it's it's good conversation it's valuable it's conversation <laughs> right so it's good listening it's you know it's informative listening and if you're enjoying it all all the better well, that's it i don't think we've got any massive angles we don't have we have our opinions but i don't think we've got any massive strong opinions that can make and you know and if people listen and i that's why i relate it back to i just love listening to two people chatting if and people yeah, like listening and then, then I they like, like listening don't i look they? into the research side of things a little bit more i do like to look at statistics you're quite good at yeah and i'm very I social I do media want heavy to check that i don't i'm not just like gobbing off just chatting rubbish <laughs> but i do and i like to check myself a lot now i didn't used to do this didn't used to be like this but i do like to to check but you're quite good you what, can read a paper you know, like on something opinions. whereas i haven't got the attention span and i'll look at alternative opinions and i'll try and like take them on board now whereas probably when i was previously i would have been like nope nope it's my way or the highway whereas now i'm a lot more open to that's funny i learned the same thing doing this yeah, I've learned yeah. the same thing doing this, yeah. It's weird because I've learned that I'm not always right, which was strange. I yeah. was right. <laughs> I was right for like 37 years of my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. I, f I think, yeah, the more you learn, the more you realise that the less you know, actually. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Been a pleasure, ladies. Been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, maybe do it again sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Thank Wait. you. Oh, hang on. Good luck with the fucking podcast. Good luck with Just a Mum podcast. Good oh, luck thank you. And everything else. Right. Three. That's it. Thank you for watching Hey Chower. If you enjoyed this episode, why not become a Hey Chower patron? Hey Chower patrons get exclusive access to premium content with guests like the one you just watched. There are private interviews with previous guests and with this guest that nobody will see except for the HR patrons. So before this podcast was recorded, I recorded an exclusive Q&A, a shorter interview structured around eight questions. All the questions were chosen by patrons beforehand and that interview is online now for patrons. That happens every time. Patrons also get access to all of the episodes before anyone else. They get advanced viewing of the episodes. And you also get other perks and bonuses. All of the information is on charliecharlie1.com. Just hit the menu item, become a patron. It'll show you everything there, including access to the HR Discord community and private patron-only channels on there. So go to charliecharlie1.com and hit the menu item, become a patron easy peasy if you prefer to listen to your podcast normally hey chower is also on spotify it's on apple Podcasts. it's on google Podcasts. it's on all of the podcast apps and if you don't even want to bother with a podcast app you can go to the, the hey chower website charliechannel1.com and you can actually play the podcast video or audio directly through the website through your browser simples thank you for watching thank you for being a supporter like the video subscribe to the channel and I will catch you on the next episode. Thank you.